Well, everyone, it finally happened. After years of waiting, we finally got our first look at the Ender Lily sequel in not one, but two trailers released only a few days apart, along with a Steam page and official website. To be clear, we knew this was coming eventually, as Binary Haze teased the project a few times on the official Ender Lily's X account. First, with this cryptic message in 2022 promising an Ender Lily's next project, and then with this post in 2023 likewise referring to the future of the Ender Lily's project. But we really didn't know what to expect, whether it would be a sequel, a prequel, or even if it would be in the same genre. As it turns out, Ender Magnolia Bloom in the Mist is indeed a true sequel, a return to the Ender Lily's world, and what's more, it's already been confirmed that the soundtrack will once again be composed by Millie. So let's get into it. In this video, I'll be taking a close look at each of the trailers to try and make sense of the new setting, characters, gameplay, and much more. The most eye-catching feature of these trailers has to be the state of the world itself. In contrast to the high medieval hamlets and castles of Land's End, Ender Magnolia is fully set in the industrial age with sprawling cities and towering skyscrapers, and takes place several decades after the reign of death in a country called the Land of Fumes. But where exactly is this located, and how did technology advance so rapidly? We know that Land's End was the smallest of six nations established by the people who defeated the Ancients, and based on items we find there, it is entirely possible that some of the other nations had considerably more advanced technology. For example, in the ruined castle we see a number of gramophones, which are audio devices that were only invented many centuries after the medieval period. Perhaps objects like this were traded for at high cost and presented to the king of Land's End by traveling merchants, like the Western Merchant. Alternatively, the Land of Fumes could be built upon the old ruins of Land's End itself, as we are told that this once flourishing country sits atop a wealth of buried magic, and that mystical powers lie beneath the earth, which feels like an obvious reference to the Verboten Domain. If these are different blighted caverns, then it would answer one of my biggest lingering questions from Ender Lilies, which is whether or not the Blight exists in other lands. There is another significant parallel too, which is that the basic premise of Ender Magnolia revolves around the homunculi, artificial beings created by humanity to bring about a brighter future. The true meaning of this statement is revealed in an official overview of the game shared with Nintendo Everything, which states that the kingdom's desire for conquest led to the creation of the homunculi, machine-like artificial lifeforms prepared to execute the king's will. It would seem that history is repeating itself here, but personally I'm more interested in the creation process of these so-called homunculi. As you may recall, one of my central Ender Lilies theories proposed that the Blight was originally a pure substance used to create the first White Priestesses, and that the clones were also grown out of Blight after it had been purified by Muriel in Lab 3. What we are seeing here with the homunculi appears to be the same process, just called by a different name. Large capsules in the background of multiple shots bear striking resemblance to those used to make the clones in the Verboten Domain. So does that mean the lilies were, in fact, homunculi? Well, maybe, but there is a key difference between these two groups. While the priestesses were the only ones immune to the Blight's corruption, the homunculi seen in the trailers appear to be the ones most vulnerable to it. For something went terribly wrong. A line in the aforementioned overview states that a recent resource harvesting mission gone awry caused toxic vapors to emerge from underground, driving both man and machine to feral madness, and the reason for these vapors was that the magic buried beneath the surface became corrupted. It is implied in Ender Lilies that the Blight of the Ancients might have been corrupted by hate, so could that be the case here as well? Or was it something else? Regardless, the citizens fled upward to escape its reach, but those who lacked power and wealth remained abandoned below. It would appear that these wealthy citizens found their way to the glowing capital at the very peak of the city, surrounded by four towers bearing radiant cross-like symbols. These are probably providing protection from the blighted smoke below, and I think the choice of symbol is significant. This is not the four-star symbol of the ancients. In fact, that symbol doesn't show up anywhere in the trailers at all, which lends credence to the possibility that the Land of Fumes may be far away from the old Kingdom of the Ancients. Instead, there is a new symbol that shows up multiple times, a diamond with a curious pattern within that looks vaguely like magnolia flower petals. It's hard to say what it might represent at this point, though it is shown to be instrumental in the creation of homunculi. 
To the developer's credit, even though this world looks very different than the one we're used to, everything shown is narratively and thematically consistent with the events of Ender Lilies. A kingdom who chooses conquest to their own destruction, a race of artificial humans, and magical caverns extending under the land that corrupt all they touch. Make no mistake, this subterranean grotto is filled with blight, but instead of spreading itself through rain via fungal sporocarps, it now spreads through mist. Still tiny particles of water, just distributed differently, and it will be interesting to see how this all began. After coming to grips with the new setting, the second most notable feature of these trailers is the cast of characters. First off, we have a brand new protagonist, Lilac. A curious choice of name, being only two letters away from Lily. And she appears quite similar to Lily in many ways. The white hair, the soft glow, both of which raise the question as to whether this might be Lily's descendant. Though impossible to say for sure, I think it's pretty likely. After all, Lily does appear to leave Land's End and go somewhere else, and it might as well be here. Furthermore, Lilac seems to have a connection to the White Priestess line in that she is able to summon spirits, an ability that only priestesses possess as far as we know. This is further supported by information found on the Steam page, which reveals that Lilac is an attuner with the power to save those infected by the fumes. Since only white priestesses can purify blight, and Lily was the last priestess, Lilac has to be her relation, right? Well, not necessarily, because there are a few other details to consider here. Importantly, purification looks… different in the trailers. When Lilac purifies the remaining experiment, she doesn't physically touch her, and the blue light emitted appears more like the Aegis Curio's restoration than it does Lily's purifying of the knights. I think what's happening here is that Lilac is purifying with the aid of a special device, her blue earring. It's the same color as the Aegis Curio, and one of the remaining citizens mentions the existence of magical implements that ward off Blight. It makes sense that as technology developed, people would find new ways to control the Blight, and perhaps they even figured out how to hold the substance within physical vessels and effectively bypass the need to draw it into oneself. These new devices would have power far beyond that of the Aegis Curio, and may have even been based on its design if Lily did in fact come to this kingdom. This explanation also makes sense of the fact that the spirits Lilac summons are blue, not red, and likewise vanish in a shimmer of blue sparks. Of course, it's also possible for both of these to be true. Lilac could be a white priestess of Lily's bloodline and also be aided by powerful new technology. As for whether we'll see Lily herself, I'm not sure. While I think Ender Lilies gave her character great closure with ending C, it would be great to see her again in some form, or at the very least learn what she did after leaving Land's End. While it's evident that Lilac is similar to Lily in many ways, there are also some big differences between the two. For one, she actually talks. Lily didn't talk because she was essentially a newborn, but clearly that is not the case for Lilac, and her very official-looking uniform suggests she is already quite capable and has experienced a great many things in the city already. Like perhaps playing a role in the creation of the homunculi. The first homunculus woman she comes across says she seems familiar, and in this shot of the creation process we see a human girl with the same haircut as Lilac. We also learn that she was separated from her companions other attuners, or perhaps scientists. On that note, let's talk about the homunculi. The first trailer states that Lilac will reluctantly bond with and journey alongside a homunculus who played a pivotal role in the country's demise, and this is clearly shown to be the veiled woman discovered at the very beginning of the game. We don't know her name yet, but she's obviously very important and positioned to be the equivalent of the Umbral Knight as Lilac's primary companion. The other prominent homunculi in the trailers is the remaining experiment, a young girl with a metal fist who appears to have been newly created before being corrupted, at least if her white gown is anything to go by. The rest of the homunculi only show up very briefly, so we'll have to wait and see what their stories are. In addition to these characters, the Land of Fumes contains a number of living humans as well in yet another departure from Ender Lilies. We meet several in the trailers, including an old woman, a young man, and a blacksmith, and there are surely many more in the higher parts of the city that we will get to know over the course of Lilac's journey. Moving away from these story elements for a bit, let's talk about the gameplay and other technical features since there are some pretty big changes here. First, I'm so happy to see a return of the same combat system, as the combat in Ender Lilies is arguably my favorite of any Metroidvania. It looks like the core of combat is the same. 
Defeated enemies become loyal to Lilac and can be summoned to fight for her, but this time there are four slots instead of three. This could mean that the total number of equipable spirits is now eight, since Ender Lilies let you swap between two sets in real time, or that the number was reduced to four instead. Unsurprisingly, the spirits themselves look incredible with interesting biomechanical designs that reflect this new time period. Another interesting detail is that the Veiled Homunculus is shown wielding a sword in one shot and a scythe in another, which means that there could be a system for customizing your spirit's equipment. That might be what this tab is for in the menu. The enemy designs also look excellent. They kept the core idea of humans fusing with nearby things to form grotesque hybrid monsters, but instead of fusing with animals like the majority of spirits and ender lilies, people of the city appear to have fused with mechanical objects like pipes and wires. Another prominent new feature is the minimap, which now features an actual display of each room's shape, size, and internal structures. The blocky and notoriously unhelpful map of Ender Lilies felt very much at odds with the polish of the rest of the game, and it's really nice to see this shortcoming addressed. I will say though, the way each room changed color to indicate whether you'd obtained all the collectibles there was pretty great, and I hope that mechanic remains present in some way. A few other minor details I noticed are that character leveling looks to be the same, as well as the healing mechanic, though instead of prayers they look like mechanical vials that may be drunk or injected instead. Equipping relics is still a thing, but in addition to that, you can collect and trade gold for upgraded items at the blacksmith's storefront. And finally, there are now difficulty options to choose from in the menu. To wrap things up, let's talk about the title. As we all know, the titular flower of Ender Lilies plays a highly important role in both the story and general themes of the game, and we have every reason to expect the same to be true here. The magnolia flower is best known for symbolizing resilience, endurance, and perseverance, as both the trees and flowers themselves are very hardy and resistant to things like disease and inclement weather. The flowers have tough, thick petals because they evolved to be pollinated by beetles, which are not known for being the most, shall we say, delicate of creatures. Curiously, while there were nine Ender Lilies, there seems to be only a single Ender Magnolia, and since the protagonist's name is Lilac, this could well be referring to someone else. Possibly the Veiled Homunculus, but that's just conjecture. As for Lilac, the white lilac flower specifically is known to symbolize youthful innocence and purity, which isn't all too surprising considering the themes of the first game. Aided by her trusty homunculi, Lilac's journey will take her from the smoky undercity to the gleaming capital, where she will find the ones responsible for this disaster and learn the truth of what happened. Where Ender Lilies was about bringing quietus to a land and a people who had already been lost, the land of Ender Magnolia differs in that it can still be saved. It is tough and resilient, holding on against all odds, and I believe that through the courage of a single pure child we will see hope and light spread like a flower blooming in the mist. Honestly, I am so excited for this next chapter in the Ender Lilies world. They've taken a bold new direction, to be sure, but it also looks like they're keeping everything that worked so well in the first game and are simply adding to it, which is always a great way to approach a sequel. The game looks absolutely stunning so far with the same gorgeous artwork, this time using a red and blue color palette rather than red and white, which will make it easy to differentiate from Ender Lilies. And of course, we already know the game will sound amazing courtesy of Millie. I will probably be covering the early access period to some degree when it kicks off on March 25th, and will for sure be covering the lore extensively when it releases in version 1.0, so be sure to subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see any of that. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and listening to my thoughts on the game, and I would love to know what you guys think as well. Do you like the time jump and new direction they chose, or would you have rather seen something else? And do you think we might see Lily again? Let me know in the comments below, and I hope to see you back here soon.